And Marie, I'm super excited that we have this conversation today because I got into your world um, a few years ago now where I got certified as a personal branding strategies through career thought leaders. And ever since I've just seen you go from strength to strength, you've just constantly raised the bars um, and providing an incredible community and space for career professionals. I'm super curious before we get into the nitty and gritty as to what are we seeing, how we best prepare for this next world of work. How did you even get into this space? Yeah, so Petra, it's so great. So I met you through that program, but it's also been wonderful to see your program explode and how you took those concepts and created the trusted authority and what a powerful place for people to find out about some of the things we're gonna talk about in terms of trends. You're already creating programs that will help them be ready for those trends. So that's exciting. I got into this space, actually, I went to school. So not very many people go to school to be a career counselor, but I went to school in psychology. And when I was getting ready to graduate with my undergrad, I went and I was like, well, I wanna do this in business, right? I wanna be in HR, but no one was hiring psychology grads to go into HR. So like, okay, I gotta go get my master's. And I got my master's in counseling and career development and human resource studies, lots of words there. <laughs> and when I did that, I thought I wanted to work on a college campus. I got an opportunity to intern with a woman that ran her own career coaching business. And I thought, well, this is awesome, right? Working with adults and a variety of people doing the entrepreneurship piece, which was, I'd never really thought about being an entrepreneur. Um, I, you know, my parents would have told you that, no, Marie, you're probably the least likely person on earth to be an entrepreneur. Um, but I, once I got into it, I really loved the work and started out as a subcontractor. So a lot of what I did in my early life was training at workforce centers and other campuses that, you know, career services staff at, at university campuses. And then I was building my own independent clients, doing some contract resume writing and then eventually moved out into doing my own coaching and resume writing and consulting practice. Um, I had met the owners of Resume Writing Academy and Career Thought Leaders at conferences and had always you know, had a good relationship with them. I was presidents of other associations and invited them to speak and those types of things. It was all relationships, right? And when they got ready to move on from the business, they called me and offered the opportunity to purchase it. So Resume Writing Academy and Career Thought Leaders have all, both been around since the mid nineties when I was youngin. <laughs> and so I did not start the organizations, but had the opportunity to take uh, the leadership role in 2015. So it's been about eight years now. This is fascinating. I actually have never heard your story. And I love how you've actually pivoted into those different directions. and. Also, what you just said, all about relationships, that you were top of mind when the opportunity came about and they already trusted you because they knew you or have been knowing you for a while back then. So very, very exciting. And now, as I said, you're constantly raising the bar with uh, providing insights and also tools and resources and an incredible community of career thought leaders and professionals. One of those resources that um, I always love and um saver is the report that you bring out every year on trends on changes and clearly the last couple of years have brought so many changes that we've never had ex been um, exposed before can you give us a little bit insights as to what have you been finding when it comes to skill sets in jobs um, and leadership trends yeah it's so interesting just thinking about so in 2018 actually some of our topics were remote work well-being and um, also diversity. So we're talking about those things in 2018, 2019. Then you get into 2020 with COVID and here in the US, the murder of George Floyd, those topics blew up. And it was like, oh yeah, we already have resources on that because we were talking about that before. And you know, it's interesting as you look at the trends, they kind of repeat, right? They go in this cycles. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about gig work in 2018 and it was all about that people felt like they had to people that had never really gotten back after the 2008 recession and then in 21 it became this topic around gig work and we just had it entrepreneurship and gig work but it's this more people want to they want to have that gig work they want that flexibility and so the same kind of topic but different driving forces behind it obviously different ways that people are doing it today versus in 2018 with the new technologies 
uh, can you think about that? Like Upwork and those things, uh, they were barely just getting started in 2018 and now it's prevalent, right? It's so easy to get on those platforms. So those are some of the topics that have endured, but they've shifted. Diversity, obviously the talk around that was much different in 2018 than it was in 2021. And how do leaders bring that in? We're hearing more and more leaders being asked for diversity statements or how do you lead diverse teams? And diversity encompassing all kinds of things as we've gotten more global, it's global teams, it's virtual teams, it's you know not just the general idea of diversity, although those are still important. Uh, and then more people talking about neurodiverse and, and people with disabilities topics within diversity that weren't as prevalent in 2018 that are more prevalent now and leaders need to be aware of that. Um, it's not just about you know, ethnicity and gender, although those are still important. You've also got all of these other aspects of diversity that are now being talked about and you are expected to have a skill set and, and some idea of how you're going to lead an organization with those in mind as well. Mm, absolutely. And, you know, the last few weeks, there have been so many um, controversial discussions around um, chat GPT, for example, how AI replaces a human skills and so forth. So I think career professionals and leaders and also individuals, we've got more complexity to deal with than ever before. What would you say is one of the um, best ways to stay on top of those trends and changes and constantly upskill without burning out? Yes, so that is a challenge. Well, and as you're talking about technology, so hiring technology is another trend that we've been talking about since, I don't know, 2018, 2017, maybe even when the ATS and JobScan and all of those systems became really popular. I think JobScan was around 2018, and it's the system that scores your resume, you know, similar to an applicant tracking system. And that technology it's interesting because it's kind of a double-edged sword. Trends are a double-edged sword. You've got to know what's coming, but you also have to look at what does that really mean for me? So like chat GPT, for instance, resume writers, you know, oh, will it replace resume writers? And so let's look at the history. Jasper and some of those other systems have been around for a few years. And we've seen that actually copywriting and positions posted for copywriting have increased. So Jasper didn't take anybody's copywriting job. It, I don't see that ChatGPT is going to take anyone's resume writing job anytime soon. I did a video on that where I demoed it and I asked it to write a resume. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my eyes are bleeding because the first thing that it put on the page was an objective. And, a, you know, objectives have been out in the resume writing world for at least seven years. So that's the challenge with some of these new technologies is one, we do need to know how to use it, know how to make it worthwhile. We can't just you know, sweep it on the rug and say, that doesn't matter because then you get left behind. So it's it does matter, how can I use it? And I've seen some fantastic things recently on how to train chat GPT to do, especially like hooks for an article or a LinkedIn post. And, but you do have to know the good inputs to put in to get a better output. And I'm guessing that if I put in really good inputs for a resume, I would get better output. But the fact that it was putting an objective in there was like, really, who, who programmed this to put an objective on a resume in 2022, 2023? But, uh, you, you know, they offer a lot of value. We have to know how to use them. And we can't get so afraid that we don't pay attention or we say that'll never take my job. I've heard coaches saying, you know, AI will never take my job. It's like, oh, that's a dangerous place to be. It's more, how can I use that technology? How are other coaches using that technology? And then I can incorporate it as is appropriate for me. So I always say that we track trends, but we're not trendy. Mm. It's not about jumping on the bandwagon. It's about understanding the trends and really digging in to see what about this could add value for me that I want to move forward? And I think that can help a little bit of the overwhelm is that you're looking at it critically, making sure you don't fall into the trap of sweeping it under the rug, but looking at it critically to see what of this really matters for me. Mm, absolutely. I love this advice. And uh, uh, it's also a good reminder with um, the AI tools, whatever it is, it's still um, based on human intelligence that feeds the beast <laughs> to then uh, develop further. And, you know, closing the eyes doesn't 
make it go away. So the question is, how can we embrace it? How can we make sure that when our role is shifting, that we leverage technology, but our focus and our main time goes towards relationship building, for example, or cre uh, creative thinking, that we know that <laughs> rather than being all of a sudden obsolete and not having done the homework and, you know, embracing the change for what it is. Well, you had asked too, how do uh, people stay in up on things? And don't feel like you have to do it yourself. I think that's part of what makes you feel overwhelmed, but it also makes you more susceptible to, um, you know, either going after something that's just a shiny object or sticking your head in the sand is when you do it on your own. There's a professional association for almost everything, right? I mean, there's a professional association for every kind of job and in any global location. And that's one of the things I love about virtual world is that we can now connect with a professional association no matter where it's at in the world and let that group of people help you track the trends and read what they're putting out and you know linkedin or whatever other social media your industry is engaged in is a great place to follow along what's going on who's credible right you got to take that discerning look at at that content and your professional associations can help a little bit with that. But it's one of the things I love about our industry in the careers and leadership space is that we we share with each other. We, we give that information to each other so that we can all be better at what we do. And then I don't have to, you know, I don't have to be all knowing or all tracking because we have a community that's doing that together. Mm, and speaking of community, your community is just absolutely fantastic. Like. Uh, Every time we are joining any kind of sessions or workshops or you name it, everyone is just so um, engaged and active and happy to share all their insights. They're giving away everything, uh, not holding back. And, you know, there's, a, there's um, I think just last year came out that companies are now getting evaluated by the size and the engagement of their audience and their community. Um, and leadership also requires you to build a community around a topic or a course. How did you build your community in such a strong manner? Wow. Well, so it goes back to that initial meeting with Wendy Enelo and Louise Kersmark were the founders of Career Thought Leaders and Resume Writing Academy. And there were other organizations that said, oh, we won't want them to speak because they're competitors. And I thought, well, that's silly. I've never seen someone who's really engaged in our world choose one organization or the other, right? They involve themselves in a few, they get certifications from a few. If we all work together, it can really build the, whatever, you know, the ocean lifts all boats, right? And so that outlook has served me since the very beginning. And I don't know that I chose it on purpose, but then once I saw that, how beneficial it was, it's like, okay, I got to stay in because it, it's hard for all of us, right? You get those little voices of, oh, don't let that person take your little piece of the pie. And you just got to realize that the world is not pie, right? If someone else has some, it doesn't mean that I get less. Mm. And so that abundance attitude is really important because otherwise you can't have a community. And also like, it's not about me. Sometimes that gets in my way and I try to take some of my own branding advice and, and make sure I'm doing my own strong brand. But when it comes right down to it, it's not about me. I don't have to be the expert. I don't have to be the, you know, the person that's everyone's looking to. It's everyone else and bringing people in together and, and letting everyone in the community be equal. And that's something that people have to work at, especially when sometimes the community expects there to be like the, you know, the all knower uh, it just doesn't work that way. And then the last thing I would say is that when I'm training coaches, I always tell them that the how is not your value. People mm -hmm. can go and read an article on how to do something on LinkedIn or how to write a resume. That's really not your value. If they could do that from reading an article, they wouldn't be your client. So when we take the emphasis off being the expert in the how and our goal, our value is really more in walking beside that person, being the coach, being the guide, even being the consultants, some of our people, you know, strategists or consultants. Um, my kids just got these things for Christmas where it's like this little egg and then you smash it on the floor and it has things inside of it. Well, this company decided that they were going to give you the directions on how to recreate the egg. And so they've got these step-by-step -step directions on how to recreate the egg. 
is impossible because it's not about the directions. It's not about how do you do it. It's about getting these little pieces to sit still while you put the other little pieces together, right? I couldn't do it. My, I was trying to have my seven-year-old help me and my husband was actually able to do it. But it just made me think it's not about having the directions. It's about actually living it, actually doing it. And I know you see this with people on LinkedIn. They, it's not that they don't know how to post on LinkedIn, right? That's easy. Yeah. It's what, what do I post and what are people going to think of me? And it's all of those pieces. So when we take our value and our worth out of knowing how to do something and being the expert and really put our value more in the relational piece and the coaching and asking the tough questions and sitting with that person, then there's less competition around, you know, the good ideas. Everybody has good ideas. It's who's going to execute it, who's going to be the right person for that client to sit next to and really go through their stuff. And that's the value that we offer, you know, and not getting caught up in being the expert as our value. Mm, I love this advice. There's also the saying, you come for the content, but you stay because of the community. And this is so true because we can, in this day and age, read everything and access every detail that we want. There's nothing behind you know, a secret wall that we couldn't access. It's just a matter of, do we implement it? Do we consistently implement it? And do we overcome those negative voices? Like you can't do it. And who are you to do this and that? Um, and Mark Schaefer, uh, he's coming back on the podcast in a couple of weeks, actually, to talk about his new book, Belonging and uh, Building Communities. And I think this is the next big quotation mark trend that companies, leaders, um, you know, individuals have to build their own community in one or another way through telegram groups, for example. And I think those small micro groups are more um, important than having a big social media following or a massive, I don't know, audience on, on YouTube or whatever it might be. Yeah, that interaction. And that's, you know, there's a lot of talk around communities and uh, memberships and those types of things have been around, I don't know, maybe a year, 18 months, it's been a, a lot of talk around that. And the new conversation in that space is you're right. One, how can you make it more around the execution than the content? People have too much content. So how can you help them move through that and execute and do that? And then I love your idea of that smaller community. How do you create that even within a larger community? How do you create that opportunity for smaller communities where people can engage and can get to know each other really well? And if your community is too large, that's not going to happen as much. Mm. And, you know, a trend uh, that I am seeing, and I think this is going to become even more relevant, is this micro specialization in your niche. Like when you say how to live your best life who are you to say that like you're not god <laughs> but if you say how to build a business if you're in the real estate industry in this kind of area uh leveraging facebook ads or something like that very specific you're attracting a small audience but they are super engaged and they are referring you the right type of clients and it's a snowball effect from there um now is there any other insight or tip or uh, advice that you would give in terms of standing out in this very competitive space. Obviously, I think specialization and micro niching is one of those quick wins um, to focus on. It's hard because it's also thinking, oh, do I lose something from this massive pie and you know, do I give away opportunities? But at the same time, you can increase your value by that. Is there anything else that you are seeing how to stand out in this competitive market? Yeah, video. So all of the trends are still pointing towards the importance of video, of course, smaller videos with YouTube shorts and TikTok and reels. And but even for the individual who's inside a company that says, Maria, I don't care about any of those things, show up on video in your Zoom meetings. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, nobody else in your team is doing that. And that's OK. But even for the first 10 minutes to show up on video, to really be there and be present, because you know that everyone else who's got the video off in their meeting, right, they're not really paying attention. <laughs> so if you want to stand out as a leader, I'd say encourage your teams to be on video for the first few minutes. We understand that no one wants to be on an hour long meeting, at, you know, every week or whatever with, uh, with the video on, but at least for the first few minutes to have that connection, to see the person, 
to just remember that we are people. I think when your picture is up on the screen, it's really easy to not make that personal connection. Mm -hmm. And if you want to advance in an organization or you even want to just have a stronger presence as a leader, I would encourage you to figure out ways to get more face time with people. Now, in today's world, that may mean that you also get some actual like real life. Oh, my goodness, I get to see you in person FaceTime. And don't underestimate that either. So we just had our first in person symposium this year after taking two years off and we went to Philadelphia. It was a lot of work and, you know, people weren't sure. So we had a smaller group and I thought, oh, is this going to be worth it? When that first group of people walked through the door, like immediately my heart said, yes, this is so worth it. There's just something that's so much different when you get people in person. And so I'd encourage you too to figure out ways you can network in person, show up at your office in person. And I know there's this huge movement against going back to the office. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to go back to the office full time. There is a human energy connection that people make when you're in person that you just can't recreate over Zoom. Best, you know, next best is to actually show up in Zoom on person because you do want, people can't remember you if they don't see you. Like it's, it sounds so obvious, right? But they can't remember you if, you, if they don't see your face. Mm, absolutely. It's all about, and this is where branding comes in. How can you stay top of mind and being recognizable and memorable from a visual and verbal perspective, but simply turning on the camera, especially when no one else is doing it, we already think, oh, of course, Marie is uh, incredible with XYZ. We've got this role coming up or whatever it might be. It's such a small little tip. It makes all the difference though. And I think also what you mentioned with video, this is the next best thing after being in person. So if we don't necessarily have the opportunity, how can I, as an employee, show up also you know, on, on a Slack channel or an internal communications channel as a leader? How can we check in with the team rather than having this boring email newsletter? How can you go on a video for a minute or two and say, this is what we're working on. This, this is a challenge and congratulations. And you've already got this connection. This brings us back to the first point that you made. It's all about relationships. If you want to progress, if you want to get the promotion, if you want to land this big client, isn't it? It is. It is. And that's one of the things that people, well, I was, I don't, this is not offensive, but older people are uncomfortable with video. Your younger mm. workers, your younger clients, they really don't care. And so really figuring out that it's not about how you look. It's not about any of that. It, and people say, oh, they judge you and there's bias. And I'd say that depends maybe your first couple of times, but after that, it's really just like I saw you in person. I would judge you no more than if I saw you in person, right? Because you get that familiarity with video and a lot of it's getting that familiarity for ourselves, seeing ourselves on video. You're, you, you know, you're more likely to judge yourself than anybody else is really caring about what you look like on video. And people remember more of what they get on video. They also, my audience has, works with executives and so they'll say, oh, executives don't have time for video. But the research shows that like 89% of executives prefer video content. So there are, you know, all the excuses that people would make, there's little data points that say that's just not true. People are using videos, executives are using videos, and the faster we can get more comfortable with it, the more we'll be likely to connect to people. And that's really what it is about, right? It's that tool to connect, to let other people connect with us more than they can through an email or a blog post. Absolutely. And also um, attracting future talents and clients and uh, suppliers or partners to the organization when I've got already a relationship because I see how people are moving and what they're saying and their accents and the tone of voice and what, whatever it might be. We feel we know this person already and it's all about this, oh, touch points. How many touch points have I had? And then more of consume content from them or you know, listen to something that they were saying, the more I feel connected or also repelled, like it goes in both ways. Um, so I agree. I think every single leader needs to focus on getting onto video a lot more uh, and not being too worried about what others say because nobody cares as much um, as we think. I heard this saying the other day on the podcast, which really resonated with me. What other people say about you is on them. What you hear, that's on you. 
like if they are criticizing you, they usually hurt themselves themselves um and they are you know insecure or whatever it might be. But what you are hearing is very much what goes in in your head. So I found that interesting. <laughs> Yeah, well, in that we care more about, I read another quote that was like, you care more about what other people say about you than you pay attention to what you say about you, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. most of the time when people are nervous about some of those things, it's really more about what we're saying to ourselves than what other people are saying about us or to us. And video is hard, right? I mean, I just do live video most of the time because it's, it flows, there's no, you know, oh, I gotta fix it, I gotta re-record that. Um, and so people will say, oh, you know, how'd you get into live videos? Like you just hit the record button. <laughs> You're just saying, you know, it's like, that's why I liked it. You didn't have to go back and fix it and, and edit it and all of those things. And now I'm paying a team to edit some videos into more edited videos, but it's, uh, it's just, it's a little bit less. We don't have to make it into more than it needs to be. When you're thinking about that connection, it doesn't need that polish. It doesn't need any of those things. So I, that's one of the big trends. And uh, here in the US, the government is cracking down on TikTok. And I've warned people like that is not an excuse not to do video. <laughs> you still have YouTube shorts and reels and Instagram and, you know, video is still important, even if TikTok, is, and I don't think it will go away here. But, you know, it, even if TikTok is not your jam, um, there's still so many other opportunities and I loved your thought even around the internal communications that people are doing with each other. You're much more likely to stand out and be remembered what you say to have it remembered if you use a short video. Absolutely. And I think it's just one tiny little change that makes all the difference for the team, like especially if you're in a large corporation and you can't physically see people uh, or meet them all the time going onto the video on a Monday morning for a couple of minutes and said, you know, excellent week last week, we did blah, blah, blah. And this week, this is what's coming up. That takes you literally five minutes with the setup, with the sending. It doesn't take any more time than writing. I probably would say it takes you less time, but it's just about getting rid of the excuses and making it a regular thing, setting up that it's easy because in a second there are some friction and there are obstacles. I need to turn the light on and the camera and whatsoever we're not doing it. And this is an easy excuse to not do it. <laughs> but also speaking of leaders, obviously they are facing a lot more challenging times. Is there anything else that you would say uh, leaders need to focus on in terms of skill development um, that they can cope with what's next? Yeah, that's a challenging thing for leaders. I mean, I really felt for leaders during COVID because they had their own lives, right? Their own challenges and then dealing with the challenges of people on their team. And similar to our video conversation, just not overcomplicating it, asking people for what they need and finding the flexibility in the ways that you can meet those needs and not making it more than it needs to be. And, you know, still seeing memes and making fun of the wellness programs, you know, that people are just trying to overdo it. and. What does that person need? Asking, listening, and doing your best to deliver that or co-create something that can do that. And I know that when you're talking about corporate structures and policies and procedures, it's not always that simple. And yet it is, right? It's easy to talk to someone to really listen to what they're saying and then to work together with them to get as close as you can to meeting their needs. And that kind of the war between leaders and workers, the quiet quitting and the, you know, all of that, that just doesn't serve anybody. Um, when I worked with leaders, it'd always be, how can we have them looking at the next step for them and at their strengths and at their vision? Because then you pull in people along behind you versus that kind of territorial, this is my spot, this is my place then you're pushing everybody else down to keep your place. And so when leaders don't have a vision, they don't know where they're going, they don't know what the next step might look like. And that doesn't have to be a promotion, right? It, it could just be the next project, it could be the next initiative. And 
when they have that future vision, they're more likely to nurture and get everyone else coming on. I think what we've seen in the last year is really that restricting of the economy, at least here in the US. I don't know if you've seen that as well. But when the economy kind of starts to constrict, then everybody's mindsets also do. And you get that territorialism and that um, closed feel, and that hurts everybody down below you. And so I think a leader's challenge, similar to what we were talking about before with that abundance mindset, is what is next? What are the next initiatives? What it, where's my next move? Again, not promotion-wise or, or necessarily career-wise, but just what is coming up that I have the opportunity to do so that you can feed those opportunities to the people below you and then ask and listen and maybe provide them with some tools to communicate what it is that they want to do, what it is that they're really good at, because a lot of people still don't have the tools and the language to be able to share those things. And so they get, they flounder because they don't know even what to tell you that they want to do. Absolutely. And I would say it always comes back to um, awareness of yourself, of your own strengths and weaknesses and how you show up to the world. And then it's easy to spot it in others when you say, oh, this is, you know, this person, is a, a, he, they need to think more before they make a decision. How can I facilitate that process rather than saying, give me an answer now <laughs> that works maybe with somebody else who is driven by that. And, you know, it it's, um, always comes back to building your personal brand first, doing the groundwork and the deep work. And then it's quite easy to show up the right way for others that you get the best out of them and not um, having this cookie cutter approach. Well, I read that somewhere that people were talking about how self-awareness is so important for leaders. And it's the thing that most people overestimate. So we all think we're most, more self-aware than we actually are. And so that's perfect. What for the leader and then also for their team to continually offer those opportunities for increasing self-awareness and for leaders that may be more important. And you, I think you wrote an article about, was it the Dunning-Kruger effect is out it's called when you, you think you're smarter than you are. And that self-awareness is definitely a place where leaders can have a blind spot. Mm, absolutely. And this is where coaching comes in and help you to navigate through that um, and those gaps and working on that. Like everyone's got gaps and blind spots. Um, it's just a matter of do you know them uh, and do you proactively have strategies and tactics to fill them or do you just, you know, cruise through that? <laughs> now, speaking of coaching, we've got incredible um, news happening in March, where we literally put everything that we just discussed together from a community perspective to uh, connecting with each other, learning from each other. Um, what is happening in March, Marie? Yes, I'm so excited. So in March of 2019, we were at uh, this venue in San Diego, where we're going to be in March this year, March 26th through 29th. And it's on the San Diego beach. It's beautiful. And we've got some amazing speakers, including Petra, as well as Greg Lavoie, who writes about um, bringing your passion back to your work. Venice Johnson, who travels the world talking about a big, bad, bold business. Uh, we also have Carol Parker Walsh, who's going to talk about how to get more corporate consulting in your business. And this is for career services providers who are in business, but also those who are in organizations like universities, career centers, college career centers, community colleges, and workforce centers. And so we have Louise Kersmark, who's one of our, our long-term trainers in the resume world. She's going to be talking about getting out of the mold and, and doing some new things with resumes and LinkedIn profiles. And Jan Melnick and Deb Dib talking about storytelling and that, of course, flowing through to your work on LinkedIn, as well as in the resume cover letter world. And just it's a great group of people and the energy there is always as you were saying before that very giving collaborative we do um, exchange tables at least twice so you get to sit down with people and just exchange ideas in addition to learning from those on stage and it's that opportunity to get together in person for our community we welcome anyone who's in the career services space that wants to come to san diego and learn from these amazing speakers as well as have the opportunity to share and learn from the other attendees. 
Mm, honestly, I cannot wait because as I said, every time I join any of the sessions that you put together or the workshops or the conferences, it's always buzzing and full of value from every single participant. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being on the show and providing so many incredible, valuable insights. Yes, thank you for having me. I can't wait to see you in person in March. <laughs> thank you.